This is a presentation from the 2013 Cannabis World Summit. Please visit www.cannabisworldsummit.com for more great cannabis information which is available to you completely for free. This information is being made available to you in part thanks to our sponsors. Please visit their websites to learn more about their excellent products and services. The following presentation is for informational purposes only. The opinions expressed are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Leaves of Hope Productions, Inc. Please note that regardless of any statements expressed or implied in the following presentation, that we do not condone you breaking any laws. We are not providing any legal, medical, or financial advice of any kind. No comments about cannabis being a cure for any medical use, expressed or implied, is to be taken as a claim or guarantee. None of the statements have been verified by the FDA of the United States, Health Canada, or the governing organizations of your particular country. And again, this information is being provided for informational purposes only, and the participants exercise their freedom of speech discussing what they believe to be true. We do not guarantee the accuracy of any information provided. It is your responsibility to evaluate the information before you choose to make any use of it. Please consult with a doctor knowledgeable about cannabis prior to using cannabis and or prior to discontinuing any medications you may be currently using. Please check with the laws of your country and region to determine whether you are legally permitted to use and or grow cannabis prior to any involvement with cannabis yourself. Even though we believe that cannabis ought to be legalized, we do not condone you violating any laws. Please review the legal disclaimers on the Cannabis World Summit website and only proceed to enjoy this presentation if you agree with all legal disclaimers, agree to hold the company, Leaves of Hope Productions Inc., and the presenters harmless and are of legal age in your region. Thanks to Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com for the music used in this introduction. So today we have Amanda Hitt on the line talking about a number of wonderful subjects. Actually, she's an outstanding um, advocate for, of course, uh, the legalization of cannabis. She's also been uh, a breast cancer survivor. That We're going to be talking a lot about that as well. And she's involved with a number of uh, cancer-based organizations, cannabis uh, activism. She's an absolutely fantastic per- uh, person, and you'll see that she's got an uh, absolutely effervescent personality that just really shines through. So I'd like to thank you very much, Amanda, for, uh, for taking the time to speak with us today about uh, the number of things that we're going to be talking about. Yay, I'm very excited to be part of this. Well, just for what it's worth, we've uh, met, of course, on uh, Twitter, and uh, of course you can connect with her on Twitter at Culture Catalyst, that's uh, with a K for both words, Culture with a K, Catalyst with a K, and of course you can find her on Facebook as well. Lots of uh, fascinating things that she's doing, so if you uh, want to just follow along and uh, see all of the, the, the interesting things, live vicariously through her, she, she's definitely <laughs> living quite a full life as well. So, uh, so Amanda, so before we get started talking about all these uh, interesting things that uh, we're here to talk about today, let me just ask you, how did you get started with cannabis in the, in the first place? Oh, let's see. Well, being that I'm from Southern California, <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's part of the culture here, but um, medicinally was when I was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, I went and, you know, did the whole thing where you get the recommendations from the doctor and uh, be formal with that with the Prop 215 paperwork. Um, but, and so that was when I actually was, you know, act, using it legally and everything. Um, prior to that, I, I you know, I'm, I don't drink. Um, I think maybe sometimes I would, I'll admit to having recreational uh, hot use, but having get, gotten, you know, the diagnosis was a whole different uh, ball game, and um, I learned a lot after that. But it was, it was initially just, just to help me with um, the symptoms and side effects of going through chemotherapy and surgery and, um, you know, also stuff you don't think about, like quality of life, mental health, um, just, you know, being, uh, having your spirits lifted. I mean, it's it's uh, pretty traumatizing. I think they say that everyone who gets a cancer diagnosis also gets post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis and usually the family members too. So um, I definitely, you know, benefited from the edibles that uh, I was able to obtain during the weeks that I did the chemo. Um, mm-hmm. It was it helped me to reduce my steroid uh, medication and the side effects from the steroids, which are terrible. And, um, you know, I mean, Ambien for sleeping, I, I didn't have to take that anymore. 
um, they want you to take benzodiazepams, Ativan and stuff. And so all those things actually were replaced by some chocolate that had cannabis in it that I was eating. I, I really couldn't smoke. Uh, my father was kind enough to try to help me acquire this vaporizer thing. And, um, you know, I, I, I got to say that my whole body was just really sore all the time. So I really couldn't even fathom breathing smoke. But, but the edibles saved my life. Okay. Well, so obviously you, you've been very positively affected by cannabis. And, of course, you live out in California, so that's, uh, of course, you mentioned that that's part of the culture out there. But So it was easy for you to have the opportunity to, to experience the, uh, the medicinal benefits uh, that it has to offer. Now, you, of course, uh, we're talking about some of the, the, the positive effects that, that cannabis has offered to you, but can uh, you share a little bit about your journey with, uh, with the breast cancer uh, just so that people can have an understanding about uh, where you're coming from and uh, because later on we're going to be talking a lot more about cancer organizations and your, uh, your cannabis activism just so that people understand um, what your history with that, uh, that's been and how cannabis has been helping with that process as well. Yeah. Well, I come from my family. Um, my mother's a nurse. She's an oncology nurse, actually. And uh, her husband uh, was a was a hospice chaplain. Um, so when I was younger, you know, doing book reports in school and stuff, I would do like Elizabeth Kubler Ross while people were doing Susan B. Anthony or Abe Lincoln. So I've always been around uh, death and dying and, and that kind of thing as far as, as the norm goes. But um, so medicine, medicine. My other sister is a nurse, and then my other sister does uh, medical uh, research coordinating. So. Um, it's always been around, and when I got sick, you know, all those those worlds kind of merged, and um, I was able to see how the cannabis combines with uh, the healthcare side of things, and just the quality of life, and what I believed was ethical, and I kind of um, started asking questions, and, you know, that's just who I am, so I started asking questions, and looking for answers, and trying to make sense of the world, and um, and, and when I saw the solution there, and I and I experienced, you know, a horrible situation um, that I'm still, you know, working out some of the uh, emotional stuff from that and, and whatnot. But I had just before getting told I had breast cancer, I had just experienced two back-to-back uh, miscarriages. Uh, one was l- later stage than the other, but um, you know, both of them resulted in surgeries that were complicated and. It was just really traumatizing, and I, I just remember when the guy told me um, that my labs came back with cancer, I told him to shut up. I was like, shut up, you've got to be kidding me, you know, and my dad was there, he almost fainted, and, um, you know, it's just something you don't expect, and it's just the worst thing to hear, and so um, it's very, it's a very lonely thing, and I think for me, I not only had physical, physiological um, relief from the cannabis during my treatment, I also had the mental health benefits of it as well, which was, you know, quality of life or, you know, just being less sad that day, you know. I, I don't recall ever getting high. Like when I was when I was in treatment, I don't recall ever getting high off of marijuana. I just remember having a little bit less ick or a little bit less pain or a little bit less, you know, sadness. It was just, it always just mm-hmm. helped be better. So that was, um, it's all kind of a blur, you know, it's like, weird. Chemo is weird. It makes you feel like you're on really weird drugs. I mean, you are, <laughs> but yeah, so that definitely um, really opened my eyes to how things can be versus how they, you know, they're, you're told that they're supposed to be this way. And, and I just started, you know, that's when I started asking questions. And, and I, at this point, I think that when my oncologist sees me coming, he jokes that I know more about my cancer than he does. But, um, you know, again, that that's kind of the cancer launched me into the uh, advocacy seat that I think that is in on my blood, um, and when I had um, when I had such a, a profound personal experience with it, I realized that you know there were things on this planet that are worse than death, and suffering is one of them. And mm-hmm. when I saw that suffering didn't have to go down like all the time as much as it is, it really got me going. And I um, was nominated by the kid I lived in in San Francisco, California to be an advocate, uh, and I, you know, it's a process you have to go through and apply for and stuff, but it's basically a nominated position with the Department of Defense that um, allows me to uh, be a full voting member on a peer review panel. So I, I got to learn about things that I never would have learned about, and I, um, heavy science, you know, real heavy, heavy medical research, and um, molecular biology, cellular biology, um, 
it's just amazing, and they embrace you, you know, it, it, mm-hmm. it, it, at these events, and um, they, they take you very seriously as a consumer because, you know, we're there to represent all the mass of the people back home that don't even know how these programs are existing, you know, and you're really changing the face of cancer care. It's, it's pretty amazing. So that was what got me exposed to the medical research side of it and starting to kind of look at policy, but not I, I'm kind of saving policy for other people. <laughs> Okay. Well, but we'll talk more about the uh, the Department of Defense uh, stuff that you've been doing there as well. But uh, let's just stay with uh, with with your your experience, uh, your direct experience. First of all, I just want to congratulate you. You're uh, currently uh, year three out of the the five year uh, remission uh, stages. Can you just uh, first of all, that I think congratulations are in order. So you're you're recovering from cancer. You've beaten cancer. You're a breast cancer survivor. So congratulations for you. First of all, uh, can you just uh, talk uh, just uh, talk a little bit when I said uh, three out of five years. Uh, just so that people understand, what is that? Uh, what is that? Uh, three out of five years uh, significance, and what does that mean? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, well, first of all, there's a huge misconception. Cancer never goes away. Period. Okay. When you have it, you have it, and you can. You know, the chemo is a systemic sort of cleansing to get it out of your whole system. And the radiation therapy is for you know a specific area, acute area, and um, and then I'm on now what's called tamoxifen, which is very common for the type of breast cancer I have, which basically has these little receptors on it that are estrogen and progestin um, receptors that basically the medication I take for five years sort of makes, um, it sort of makes the, um, like a no vacancy. If there were any cancer cells floating through my blood, it's going to, you know, they feed off of estrogen, so it's going to make them no vacancy. So it's not like I have to shut my estrogen down, but it but it makes it uh, unavailable. So the, the, it's a long uh, long time that drug's been around, so it it, it works well. And um, basically, there are side effects and things, but you know you have to pick your poison, like I said. So it's a huge part of my treatment plan. It's a huge um, chunk of my uh, defense for my treatment, and I have to just you know continue forward with that. So I um, being premenopausal at the time of diagnosis. Um, that's why I took that medicine versus an aromatase inhibitor, which is uh, what you would be taking if you were if you were already in menopause at that time. So, um, yeah. So I had I had a lump back to me. I was able to save my breast. Uh, you know, there's horror stories you hear. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was from being pregnant. I thought it was a milk duct or something. I was like, oh, whatever. But um, you know, it's actually it's really an epidemic, and um, a lot of it has to do with um, you know our, our environment. I think that I think that env- I think that genes load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger, mm-hmm. and our environment is in a status of affairs. I mean, you know, with all the drive-through and the poor food choices, and the kids having fatty livers and diabetes, and you know, at least for America, I can say, you know, we've got we've got a lot of problems with that kind of stuff. But um, so, getting back to the to the to the cancer, you know, I think that you know, I don't have an, a hereditary cancer. I know most of the people that I have met. You know, their cancer did not show up on a mammogram. You know, they found it themselves. I mean, so basically, I just it really I understand the value of thinking outside of the box, questioning everything. You know, learning that the doctors that who I thought were like they were really kind of hierarchy. I thought they would probably be near the top. You know, we were raised to look up to the med- medical field, and I realized that you know I kind of joke around that they're sort of like robots, but I mean, really. They are there to implement laws or, or or standards that are set forth by the National Institute of Health and National Cancer Institute. So those things are based on uh, gold standards um, that were created as a result of clinical trial results. Now, you know, you look at that. Okay, who takes clinical trials? Well, not not really very many people, but not not the bulk of the majority. So, um, so really questioning and understanding, you know, your options with everything. I mean, whether it's, even if you're pregnant and you're looking at doing a, a midwife versus a C-section. I mean, you know, there's different, we have options. And a lot of times we are so busy in this world we forget that we have options. And I think that, I feel like that's my duty is to um, kind of expose this to uh, those two different ends of the spectrum and help people connect the disconnect. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, you know what? Actually, you've, you've said a number of fascinating things here, and also we've we've had the pleasure of speaking for a few hours <laughs> preparing for this call as well. And uh, so there's a couple of interesting things that I'd, I'd just like you to, uh, to to talk about. Of course, you uh, a few minutes ago mentioned that uh, 
the genetics um, is, is the gun, but it's the environmental factors that pulls the trigger. And, of course, I remember uh, you, you spoke at length about uh, some of the connections that you've started making, like, of course, regarding the birth control pills that you were on uh, with the, uh, the breast cancer uh, rates. I, I remember you spoke a lot about that as well. And, of course, there's other environmental factors as well that uh, that uh, – Right. Due to pollution and uh, and things that Food. we're ingesting into our bodies, can you talk a little bit about uh, all the research and things that you've learned and uh, some of the things that you shared were just absolutely fascinating about, of course, how you were on birth control pills that you believe led to the cancer that you've had, but of course there's a lot of uh, correlations uh, or, or color, color, corollaries uh, based on that that we are literally getting cancers because of the things that we're ingesting, whether it be the pills, unbeknownst to us, foods. pardon me, yeah, unbeknownst to us. Unbeknownst to us, yes, absolutely, yeah. and then that's of course uh, the scariest part is that uh, we're we're led to believe that these things are relatively safe, or we're never exposed to the dangers of them. And uh, can you just share a little bit of background information or some information about that? Because I think some of our listeners would uh, really find that uh, to be intriguing at the very least. Absolutely, um, I think that food knowledge is something that we've completely lost touch with. Um, I think that you know I spent some time trying to figure out. Is the world, uh, are they corrupt, are they out to get us, or do people just not know? Because when I was learning about GMOs and I started learning about my the birth control you mentioned, it was actually an injection. It was from Depo Provera. And I mean, you know, I was so fired up. I wanted to file a class action lawsuit against the FDA because it was so unfair. And, you know, for example, the disconnect I'm talking about is that I discovered the FDA had put out a publication saying this medication should not be given absolutely for more than, you know, two years or whatever it was. And in, in that case, it has to be a extreme circumstance. Nothing else works. Like, say, maybe somebody could get um, fatally ill if they got pregnant or something. Mm-hmm. There was just some real extreme circumstances. And um, so I was on it for eight years. And and I took that paper this that I put... This is not unusual. For, Sorry for interrupting, but, I mean, so you're on yeah. this for eight years. The the FDA is saying that it shouldn't be any... Anybody should... Nobody should be on this longer than two years. But... Correct me if I'm wrong. There's a lot of women on this who are on it for extended And they period. still are. Yeah, and they still are. And so the the issue is that, you know, the FDA has these printouts. You can do one for the lay person and one for the for the clinician or the doctor. Mm-hmm. And I printed one of each, and I took it into that Planned Parenthood that was in Northern California, and I, I said, hey, um, I, I heard about this black box. And this was dated. I think this um, was actually dated, I think, six months or something prior and you get these shots every every three months. It's a three-month shot. So, you know, it's an intramuscle shot deep in the arm or in the um, hip, and it is made up of, you know, progestin, which is a synthetic hormone. So in a developing human, young uh, male or female, you know, hormones are, are going to be disruptive. Um, so I started kind of wondering why is this Planned Parenthood who gets funding from federal government and also, who you know, I, I trusted the Planned Parenthood. I thought they were cool. That You know, they, they, they would tell me something like that. And so it really shocked me um, years later when I was doing the uh, the work with the uh, Department of Defense on the medical research, and I realized that uh, I met a doctor who was telling me, um, you know, where to go look for some more information about this because she said, of course, Depo Provera causes breast cancer. She said, we already know this. And I almost passed out, you know. Uh, because, again, they're still issuing this stuff, uh, you know, all over the place. So I just feel like it doesn't qualify as consent when you don't know. And and I think there's a lot we don't know. So with food, for example, you know, everyone, I get I get uh, loud as well with some of these companies. I just put up a thing the other day on my Facebook talking about, you know, boycott ConAgra because whether they did it on purpose or not does not change the outcome. And these chemicals are being used like GMOs, even preservatives, or um, if you're talking about body products, parabens, you know, I, I have to say EWG.org, which is Environmental Working Group, are, um, it's a fantastic organization, and they have a database on their website called Skin Deep, and you can go plug in a product, say like Crest Toothpaste or Tom's of Maine, and it'll, it'll tell you, or you can look up an ingredient, alternatively, and it will tell you, cross-reference that, and it will tell you exactly what the score is on their scale, and they're like basically an under uh, watchdog kind of um, group for consumers on these things. And there's some things like you never would have expected to have such a high score of toxicity. And some of the categories that they are naming are, um, for example, 
there's a lot of things that are disruptive to the endocrine system, reproductive system. So these are things like when you, I don't know if you think of that when you think of breast cancer, but, but that's really what breast cancer is. Um, the type I have is the most common, I think, and it's basically... Had, had, had. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be using the C word now, so instead of you saying it out loud, it's the C word um, as a way to be sensitized. But um, anyways, uh, where was I for <laughs> Um, you were talking about the type of cancer that you had, the endocrine system. Oh, the uh, hormone, yeah. The hormone, yeah. yes. So you can go look now. Like, for example, we talk about food. We're talking about, um, think about dairy products, eggs, cheese, milk, and milk, and all these things. And um, they all are very important, that we, you know, that we eat those that are clean, the, the clean versions of that, because the hormones and the antibiotics that those are, are fed are actually... Um, they're not something our body knows what to do with, and it, it disrupts our endocrine system, literally. So that's all cancer is, is a mutant cell or, a, or you know, like a byproduct of something gone wrong on the, on the four factory line of DNA. So okay. when we end up with this stuff that our body doesn't, you know, have a way of digesting, whether it's um, you know, certain hydrogenated corn, cottonseed oil or something, you know, it just it basically boils down to at a cellular level, our body doesn't know what to do with it, and we can either clean it out, you know, with our food, sweet and stuff, but the knowledge, the food knowledge isn't there. There is no pressure in our in our society to be well and, I mean, to take care of ourselves in the right way, you know, all of this uh, fast-paced, um, you know, eating, it's just it's just disgusting. So, um, I, I really think that all of this, the food knowledge and food education goes hand in hand with plant education, trees, marijuana, cannabis, whatever you want to call it, um, as consumers, and I, you know, I feel like it's our, it's our, basically, our civil right, you know, the, the hemp plant. I, I just, I, 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 the whole thing to me has um, just been pretty eye-opening. So, um, you know, there are, there are these chemicals. Like I said, you can go look up um, an ingredient, or you can look up, like for example, there was a Susan G. Coleman perfume a year ago that had. Some chemicals in it, and it was a fundraising perfume. They're the biggest, you know, breast cancer fundraising organization, at least in the United States, maybe the world. So they had a fundraising perfume called Promise Me, and it was made just to raise money. And so it turned out that I heard from this other great organization called Think Before You Pink, because there are a lot of us think breast cancer. Think before you what? Think before you pink. <laughs> pink like the color pink. Okay. Because okay. there's a lot of us. Pink, like pink is the color for breast cancer, but you know I don't like pink. I, I never have liked pink, and now I really don't like pink. And um, it doesn't remind me of, of of anything good except breast cancer. But um, you know, thinkbeforeyoupink.org is another watchdog, and they they they're doing. I would recommend you check them out. But they had brought it to my attention that there was tulane and benzene used in this perfume. So I went and looked it up, and sure enough, you know, and like, I think they were both a ten on the score of toxicity, and both of them were known carcinogens. Both of them were known endocrine disruptors, and reproductive system disruptors. So this is something you see a lot in perfume. What I'll just say perfume, like generic term. Well, a lot of cosmetics been, uh, products have these types of products in them. Yeah. From so, shampoos, soaps, uh, makeup as well. Yeah. Everything. I mean, it, it's funny you think about girls shaving their armpits and, it's, and then rubbing aluminum deodorant on the, open, on the open pores of their armpit, which is full of lymph nodes, pulling it into their system, uh, no wonder we have so much breast cancer in this in this in this country. And um, so, yeah. Hmm. Actually, that's an yeah. interesting uh, way of looking at it. I have to stop actually using uh, all these um, antiperspirants and, uh, and and artificial chemicals for I can't remember how many years it's been now that I stopped using it. But uh, there's there's natural substitutes that, uh, of course, they work. They absolutely yeah. And do some work. people don't want to do that, and that's their choice. But I believe it is their choice to make a con- an informed consent, you know, decision mm-hmm. about something like that. And I do not believe that. Today, I'm in a culture or living under a government that provides that for me. It, it, it is not free or freedom when when there are actually fatal ingredients being, you know, put into this everyday products that we use without our consent. And sometimes they do know. Sometimes they don't know. I even went to a cancer camp one time, and I'm not going to name – it was a great camp, but year, two year, year, maybe a year and a half, two years later, I found this sunblock from the camp, uh, going through a box, and it was um, the John Wayne Cancer Foundation had their own line of sunblock products, and they had donated, obviously sponsored this cancer camp for young adults, and 
you know, it was an outdoor adventure camp, and I had just finished my chemotherapy. My whole body was brand new and, you know, growing new cells and things and being wiped out from the from the chemo. And um, and I went into this outdoor adventure thing for, for seven days and slapped, you know, slathered my body in that sunblock every day, and we were in the sun all day. And I got home and, you know. It absorbs it. It's your largest organ, and, of course, it absorbs everything that you put onto it. And, and I, I was really like a baby, you know. I was like a brand new newborn baby with that. After chemo, it's like it takes, um, I kind of think of it like the matrix, and it sort of sends a big warp through the matrix of your body, you know, of everything mm-hmm. that, that you know. It sort of resets all the DNA. So, so I saw this bottle. So your body was susceptible to uh, any chemicals that you might have been putting into it. Like you needed yeah. purity and, uh, of course, focusing on health, not uh, ingesting yeah. poisons, whether it be three or And, and I didn't even know it was poison, but, I mean, you know. And not only that, but you're also, I think, in a way, you're retraining your um, – you know, it's an opportunity for, for new growth, and you're retraining, you're resetting your, your DNA because all that cancer or a tumor is, whether it's, whether it's malignant or benign, it's just mutant cells that have clustered together. And that mutant cell that started was just something that happened on the Ford factory line of your DNA replication that basically got it, um, you know, something funky happened, and it started making these funky little mutant cells. That's all it is. And so I feel like that's probably, partly why I feel it's my right to... Um, to have these options available to me and, and other people because, um, you know, I didn't I didn't do anything, I mean, to get this cancer. And, and uh, most people I know that have breast cancer specifically are very healthy women and young and athletic and they're vegetarian or they're triathletes. It's just scary. So mm-hmm. it's definitely um, the, what we're eating and then the environment. I mean, I'm not going to get all into chemtrails or any kind of, like, conspiracy theory stuff. I don't even have to go there. This is this is scary enough. This, fic- mm-hmm. this, this is stranger than fiction right here. You know, well, there's a big cool. disconnect, as, as I remember you put it yourself, there's a huge disconnect between uh, the FDA, you know, the information, they already know this is carcinogenic uh, stuff here, and of course, uh, they have all these recommendations, whether or not to be using it, or limited use, and of course, uh, they're being prescribed, like you were talking about the uh, the birth control pills, but I mean, it's even the additives for cosmetics, as you were just mentioning, but even into the foods that we ingest uh, directly itself, so we don't have yeah. to do these uh, conspiracy theories with the, uh, the, right. the chemical contrails, as you're just alluding to, but uh, there's just yeah, enough the environmental stuff. toxins that uh, they were were exposed to that that is known to be carcinogenic or, or yeah. create uh, create and precipitate other problems as well. So, exactly. any, anything that you want to mention about uh, about these known problems that uh, we're constantly ingesting or being exposed to? Yeah, I think that the best thing people people need to do is self advocate, and that goes for every single category of life. And you know, it, it's really hard to accept the fact that that those people that we've trusted, wherever they are, aren't mm-hmm. all that trustworthy. I mean, like, come back to the perfume, or excuse me, the sunblock. I, I looked up the sunblock, and there was two different parabens. Because at that point, I found this sunblock, and I had been in the habit at this point of reading labels instantly. You know, I just do that now. Mm-hmm. And the two that stuck out, there was two different kinds of parabens in that, and I just wanted to throw up. I was so upset. And I thought, you know, how does this happen? I mean, are they so desperate to get a sponsor for Sunblock that they let this happen? And I, I ended up concluding it was nobody's fault. And I ended up going online and I kind of did a little exploitation of, uh, of the John Wayne Cancer Foundation and gave them an opportunity to remedy it because I told them, you know, it's obviously not something you did on purpose. But, but you know, you've you got to expose it. You've got to tell people, okay, here's what's going on. And it's just frustrating because with so much of the stuff going on right now these days, people don't want to hear it because it's uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's hard to understand why somebody would be keeping a plant or whatever. It just doesn't make sense, right? It just it makes me feel like I'm crazy. So um, same thing with, with the food. I mean, you know, I, gosh, the other day somebody left a, apples from um, McDonald's kids meal in, mm-hmm. in uh, it was out. It was like a bag of apples. Mm-hmm. And there was maybe, maybe one was taken out of it. I don't know if you've seen their kids' apples. They peel the skin off, which is like, First of all, I think no, 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 because that's where a lot of the nutrients are. But anyways, well, then, um, you know, that's also where all the pesticides are when they uh, they spray the apple trees, right? Uh, they just uh, sit on the skin of the apple. So I just, but again, it's the choice has been taken away. Like some kids right, don't right. like to eat the skin, some kids do, and they take away that choice when they make these like you know and like android looking apples. So the apple sat opened, exposed to air in the car for five day or four nights and five days. And do you know that those apples? Did not even turn brown or change a bit in their in their look. I took a picture of it every day and I posted on Facebook. On Facebook, yeah, 
I'm dead serious. And you know what? I, this all came from... What is that, irradiated? I, what is, is that kind of chemical I, treatment? Like, how, how is that possible for an apple to do that? That's, uh, I tweeted I tweeted them, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm assuming it's got to be marinated in some kind of chemical because you know, even, even avocados or whatever, you hit the oxygen and it's going to turn a little brown, you know. The apples well, do that. The, tr- the trick is, of course, you can uh, coat apples or avocados with a little bit of lemon juice or anything with vitamin yeah. C. Of course, the, uh, the, the antioxidant acid. effect of the acid will, of course, uh, counteract the, uh, the oxygen, so the avocados will stay green or, of course, the apples will stay, uh, stay, uh, stay fresh yeah. for, without browning. But the, the point is for to stay four or five days, as you just mentioned, that, uh, that is a bit suspicious. I'm wondering if, it, because, I mean, there's also natural enzymes within the fruit themselves so when you start cutting uh cutting it open um you know the wilting process the uh you know the dk process will get started i mean bacteria will will start eating away at it so the uh, so, of course we're not saying anything against mcdonald's right now <laughs> no absolutely not not at all <laughs> we don't was, know anything was... we're just we're just speculating right. here but uh <laughs> nonetheless uh it's an interesting uh thing that just doesn't make sense just from that observation you know, to be honest joan clark who is the heiress you know McDonald's. She's from San Diego, and she's done a ton of stuff for the community down here. I have, I have no problem with with anybody, you know, reaching the American dream and doing well or whatever. But, but I again, it goes back to consent. And I don't, I wasn't expecting to see those apples look like that. And and I've never seen apples look like that. So now I want to know, you know. And I tweeted, and I tweet, and I asked McDonald's what had happened here. And, you know, people put out pictures all the time on Facebook and stuff. And there was like a picture of a hamburger. And then a week later, the same McDonald's hamburger, you know, it was like, it looked the same. And I thought, you know, oh, I want to try that someday. Because in, in high school or junior high, I was the girl who, who heard the story. And I went out to test the theory, you know, and I, I put the buried marshmallow cherries in the ground. Because someone had told me they were made with formaldehyde. And, and, and sure enough, I dug those cherries up a couple months later and out of the dirt and the soil. And they were exactly the same. So I never really? have been able to eat those things ever. But, you know, again, so... That's fine if you, if you know, I just think that there's a consent that has to happen here. And rather, like, like the way they put all that, um, when you go to the grocery store and you, you buy, like, red meat, I guess, they, mm-hmm. I guess they fill it with some kind of a weird, like, bright red sauce or something to make it appealing to the consumer. These things, I'm not saying they're not okay to do. I'm just saying it should be a choice. Mm-hmm. And they are taking away our choice when they give us only one uh, way to do it, or one, um, you know, or, or even when they skip the knowledge that we need to make the decision, you know, informed consent. So, um, I, I really am, am looking forward to seeing some changes in the food food education here. Just something that you mentioned, of course, uh, talking with the, uh, the the lady uh, or the person who, um, who was involved with the McDonald's thing. Uh, of course, you were saying that uh, uh, does a lot of nice things, but uh, just, just something that. Uh, just the way you said it just uh, reminded me of the saying that you say that there's no profit in curing the body if doing so destroys the soul. And just uh, uh, perhaps a little uh, corollary to that would be, of course, there's also no profit in making a profit if uh, doing so also destroys the soul or destroys the body too. Because uh, So there's a lot of companies that are profiting from the demise of people. And Mm -hmm. I have to say, you know, like, let's just put aside religion and spirituality. I mean, like, forget about heaven and hell or any such uh, concepts, you know, just, just from a moral perspective um we have to of course there's so many discussions uh that, that we talk about uh, that with many of the other speakers in the summit as well that uh, it, it's obvious that the motives of the companies is that profits are more important than human life and it's sad right. w- when we look at it, everything that you've been saying is these companies are using these products that or ingredients in their products that um are destroying us Flat out mm-hmm. destroying us, and it's ultimately because of uh, profit. So I think that we need to we need to do a fundamental 180 change in mm-hmm. the way we think about food, cosmetics, and 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 everything in our lives. Because what does it profit us to to enjoy a Twinkie or you know, sorry for uh, picking on any particular product, but uh, uh, enjoying any convenient type of food that uh, immediate gratification. Uh, the immediate gratification when ultimately it leads to our demise, right? So Yeah, and then we're going to be paying for, you know, it's just like having the, 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 the SPF suntan lotion contain carcinogens, you know what I mean, at the cancer camp. It's just the irony yeah. is just... Great. Yeah, and the well, the irony, of course, is that it's being used at a cancer camp. But of course, the irony is it's uh, being utilized to prevent potential skin cancer, and yet it's carcinogenic in and of itself. So it's just uh, so where, yeah, it's like where did that, where did that? It's like stop. You know, you tell the world stop. I just, I just don't understand why people weren't coming, you know, out with the angry 
pitchforks, you know, the villagers, angry villagers or whatever, because some of the stuff that I make available to the public online just sometimes doesn't get attention that I would have expected, you know, to get. And I think a lot of it is just shock and awe. I think that it's easy for people to um, just go with the flow sometimes and out of sight, out of mind. But, you know, some of us are born with this innate inability to do that. And I think that that's my problem. Um, I, when my grandfather died, I did some genealogy classes at college and I did some research on my family and I was able to confirm a rumor that I, you know, was told over the years from my grandparents. But it, I'm, the, I'm the seventh great grandniece of Patrick Henry, the famous orator. So when I think about that and I'm having a bad day about being a loud mouth or maybe I'm doing too much advocating or something, you know, I, I, I try to think about maybe this, is, maybe this is, you know, why not me? Why not me? I, I didn't, uh, I didn't ask for any of this stuff, but, but you know, I'm just trying to, to kind of share the information because I don't know where it's all going. I just know that that these are things that actually manifested themselves into the form of a cancer into my body, and I believe that you know, like I said, the, the devil Provera birth control. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying it could be prevented or what I want it to be. I'm accepting everything I have today the way it is, but. Um, I just don't understand how there is even any profit in this when you know, there really isn't because, you know, that's where we get to the oncological industrial complex mm -hmm. uh, concept. And that's like, you know, you talk about all the things that have to be done to undo the way things are to, to make hemp, you know, the new black and all these things. But beyond that, it's really, really deep. I mean, um, even, even some of the big uh, funding goes towards uh, more like chemotherapy and then, you know, regimens versus, you know, discovering like maybe the source. Um, another another big issue I have is this BRCA gene, BRCA. It's a breast cancer gene. And just like the way that, you know, we have controversy with the patent on the, on the marijuana plant, we also have Myriad Genetics, which is a huge pharmaceutical company that um, basically has a patent on this, this gene and, and basically determining if a person has the, the uh, mutation on this one or mm -hmm. two. And, um, the reason I have a problem with this is because, A, you know, you get back to the whole concept of you cannot patent nature. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how can you, how can you patent a molecular pathway with kinases? I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It's just unless you're maybe God, you know, and, and that brings up a whole other subject. <laughs> but... They're doing this, um, and so women who find out they have breast cancer, the standard would be to get them tested for this. It's really common with Ashkenazi Jewish women because it was um, a, basically the hereditary trait that's handed down. Um, but, but you're starting to see now, I don't, I don't know if this is mainstream or not, but you're starting to see this BRCA gene becoming spontaneous versus hereditary, and that's scary because that means our cells are doing things that we don't, we don't even know why. And there's so, I think that there's too many uh, studies that focus on um, you know, the the sick cell or the, you know, the defective cell, the mutant cell, and then the responses to treatment versus let's look at the cell in its healthy state and maybe some of the dynamics that go on, that, you know, maybe cause it to become in a mutant mutant or, you know, cancerous state. I mean, I just, I think that if people like the lay person knew a little bit more about some of this high-tech stuff, they would probably be a little bit more involved in their in their care and whether, you know, you don't have to be sick. You could just you're talking about going to the grocery store, you know, they would probably make eating choices. I mean, it it's disgusting what some of this stuff, you know, is that we're putting in our bodies, and um, and it, it, our bodies just can't digest it. Is the bottom line. So, you know, everything has to have a have a place to go. And um, I just feel like there's a lot of profit in having uh, cancer be sort of like a population control or something. I mean, I uh, I, I think that you know, like you said earlier, the hemp plant. Is, Save a lot of economies and a lot of different areas, um, sectors in our in our um, in our world. But mm -hmm. but you know who's who's going to do that? I don't know. Maybe maybe we're doing this now by talking about this stuff. But obviously the people are not going to rise up and be as upset about it as I am <laughs> because I mean I, I'm not going to wait for them to you know to join the parade here. But um, mm -hmm. I think that if they did have a little bit of knowledge about this stuff, because it is a lot of stuff, you know. Um, yeah. You know, it sounds like I'm accusing the government of, of, of corruption or whatever and genocide. I mean, you know, take it, take it with a grain of salt, but take it, you know. I, I think it's really ignorant um, and foolish for people to to just pretend like everything's fine because it's not fine. 
So. And I think you said it perfectly right there. It's uh, it's definitely not fine. And in fact, uh, th- this rabbit hole goes really deep. It's uh, of course cancer. Uh, there's so many other topics that uh, we've touched upon today about the uh, these ingredients and various uh, different products that we ingest or uh, put upon our skins or are exposed to in various different ways. But of course. There's, as has been said before, uh, cannabis. Uh, I mean, cannabis does uh, ha- is a huge part of a solution for a lot of problems that uh, that we're talking about. Of course, I'm even uh, now saying that I think that uh, cannabis, uh, legalizing cannabis, is the number one most important political issue of this time because of the number of solutions that this one simple act can actually provide us. But re- mm-hmm. that being said, regardless. Uh, unfortunately, the government cannabis is just one tiny little drop in a humongous bucket of injustices and things that are really wrong with uh, the systems. I mean, there's just so many issues. So, uh, can, uh, so I mean, but we can do gonna, it. We can do it, though. I, I, pardon me. I really think we can do it. I really think we can do it, though. You know, I mean, if you look at how many people get ready to to get hyped up for like the Super Bowl or some kind of you know a different kind of cultural event. People show up when they need to, and and if I think that if if the right information was delivered to them, they would agree that this is not okay. You know, it, you, you know, you have to identify the problem first. And we've been told for a long time that there's no problem and that cannabis is bad and stuff. But you know, while we're busy bastardizing these these dispensaries and these people, you know, some of them are trying to give people their medicine. Some of them are definitely trying to make a profit. Um, but I really don't think that it's any kind of gateway to any other worse drugs. If anything, I think Arizona just published an article the other day about a study. Their crime has gone down, and, and their students are doing better in, in their, I think it was high school level, um, now that they've, you know, changed their cannabis laws. So uh, I just, I encourage people to have an open mind and um, to just, you know, only trust yourself. Don't trust anyone. And, and I don't mean that in a paranoid way, um, I just mean that it's, you know, it's, it's empowerment. You need to empower yourself because otherwise, uh, you know, I just, I, for me, that's just not happy, not, not a happy life. But anyways. Anyhow, of course, we, we need to uh, be doing more to, to change the system. And unfortunately, I, I, was, I have to admit, I'm a little bit pessimistic in, the, in that respect because I see there's just so much changes that needs to happen. It's just not happening uh, fast enough uh, as far as I'm concerned anyways. But, of course, we've got to be hopeful. We've got to be optimistic and, of course, uh, educating the people because, as you kind of pointed out yourself, we, once people realize and are properly stimulated and motivated, of course, they'll show up for the Super Bowl events. Hopefully, once people realize that uh, there's these injustices, hopefully more people will get motivated. And, of course, uh, being educated about the truth and the facts of the matter, um, hopefully this will will give the needed stimulation for these changes to occur. Part of the reason why the summit and so many other uh, organizations and, and events are happening around the world for various different topics, not just about cannabis, but there's so many so many uh, important subjects that uh, right now desperately need uh, the mm-hmm. public's attention. But anyhow, uh, I'm just going to move on from that. People don't right know where to go. You know, people don't know where to go for this. They 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 are they are scared because it's you know illegal, and they think that um, I've seen that since since I worked at. Um, for the doctor in Northern California who wrote the recommendations. All walks of life, all ages of people came in there. And I still, to this day, every week, I will get an email, at least one, from someone who is asking me a question and you know about where can they get medication, where can they get oil, what's this about, you know, Rick Simpson, what's this about that? Um, you know, do you know of any open trials? So I constantly try to keep, like, you know, these clinical trial things going, and I try to put out information regularly so people can count on that when they when they are uh, subscribing to my page or whatever, that they can get that information and it's going to be, you know, unbiased. I, I have my opinions, but I don't ever spill it out onto my um, social media platforms. Um, not really, you know, you know, usually, but, um, but you know, that's the whole trick that I'm trying to, you know, kind of go with is that I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to convince them of any specific ideal. I'm just trying to provide information because I think that if you saw the information, you would probably agree with me. And, um, you know, like with the FDA and the... Um, that, F, that Modernization Act they did, which you know required the National Institute of Health to create a public info resource, you know, on certain clinical trials regulated by the FDA, um, you know, like a registry for for federal and public um, funded clinical trials that are going to be conducted under the investigational I think it's called N I N D investigational new drug applications, which tests the effectiveness of experimental drugs for patients with, like, serious and life-threatening diseases or conditions. Well, that's how they, I just, this is a loophole. That's how, that's the 1997 FDMA, FDA Modernization Act, Section 113, basically says 
that that's what uh, their role is. And and because I was trying to figure out why everyone's funding, you know, this research, but yet it's still Schedule One. I was just really at the end of the day, I was confused. And I just really wanted to know. I still don't know, um, you know, what the story is because FDA is the one who also keeps it in Schedule One status. Mm-hmm. And it's just so confusing that they would be out here um, not only funding tons of uh, of research on it, but also you know as as it being cannabis being a um, you know beneficial to health. But they're mm-hmm. also you know we got this this patent issue now they're now they've started issuing patents and there's another application that has been made public about another uh, patent application that that someone's trying to get. So you know the first one was was uh, excuse me filed in 1940. And um, as cannabinoid, you know, as a neuroprotectant and antioxidant. Well, I just don't understand why it's been bastardized for 73 years, you know, and beyond. <laughs> when um, they're in the back, I kind of picture like the Wizard of Oz when he's behind the curtain and he's it's actually just a little guy and he's like cranking a wheel. <laughs> mm-hmm. I picture I picture our government kind of like that with this, you know, it's sort of a facade they're putting on. But anyways, I'll, I'll let you uh, move on. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, well, you touched on a lot of different things there, but you know, if anybody uh, wants to look that up, I should tell you the patent. The patent number is the U.S. United States patent, and it's six six three zero five zero seven, six six three zero five zero seven. And you have that again, memorized? is that just off the top of your head? You know this number? Isn't that sick? I know. <laughs> Sometimes people will put it on the internet and they'll just list the number, like just to, like a rabbit hole kind of thing, or go. You know, people come up with creative ways to try to disseminate this information because you know. It's important, and um, I, I think that it's, it's confusing, and it's a hard paradigm to wrap your head around to think that you know the government isn't isn't taking care of us and all that stuff. But you know, look at the facts. Well, I we've heard been, led, well, we've been led to believe, you know, like of course uh, they come up with the food pyramid and they do all these things to uh, supposedly look out for us. But the, the fact of the matter is, I, I firmly believe that if you do the opposite of what the government tells us to do in general, you're doing the right thing. If you do the opposite <laughs> of general, uh, uh, general conventional wisdom then you're doing the right thing. It's like uh, the opposite of what we've been taught to believe is actually the truth. And and that's really a sad thing, especially when it comes to our government, because, you know, ultimately we should have our faith in our government. The government really, of course, the ideal is it, of it is by the people, for the people, looking out for our best interests, right? But mm-hmm. the, the fact of the matter is... Um, it, <laughs> the, the, the truth is actually a, a very sad reality that uh, that, in fact... We, we are not the government's uh, primary interest, and, and that's uh, that's unfortunate. And there's a lot that it could be said there, but I'm going to sort of uh, not go down that road. But speaking of the government, there's, uh, of course, uh, the Department of Defense organization that you were involved with, the uh, CDMR, the CDMRP, uh, uh, which if, uh, can you just talk a little bit about that just so uh, people can uh, have an understanding of, of course, you got yeah. a lot of education, a lot of experience uh, being part of that organization as well. Uh, can you share a little bit about that with us today? Yes, it's absolutely wonderful program. Um, breast cancer research was lobbied, uh, funds were lobbied for back in the 1970s, and it was issued, I think, a couple hundred bucks, you know, they gave them. And it, every year has gone to be a bigger number, bigger number, and now we're at $150 million that, that, that Congress allocates for um, medical research just on breast cancer annually. And every year it's threatened, and, and you know, we we fill out petitions to get that um, reinstated, and Sometimes it's less, but it, I think 2012 it was 150 million, and um, and that was for fiscal year 2012. And it's basically a nominated position that I was um, nominated for in San Luis Obispo County, uh, just for my advocacy efforts um, down, uh, when I lived up there. And you go through an interview and an application process, and you know, it's really it's the hardest thing I've ever done academically in my life. But it's also the most rewarding thing because, it's, um, like I said, you're a full voting member and you go to D.C. and you know, it's a 1099 kind of a income. You know, you're just contracted. I'm not in the military. I never have been. But it is the Department of Defense is kind of the uh, the top of the umbrella for all these things. And when you look at the hierarchy in the military, so they oversee different things. And now I think they've got maybe 20, 30 different programs, um, everything from like neurological stuff to cancers to um, spinal cord injuries and stuff, and you can you can apply for this program, and you have to be nominated because you have to prove it and demonstrate that you're you know actively advocating for, in your community because they really do want the voice of 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 who you represent to come to that room of lab you know scientists that uh, you know are are highly highly expert at their job, um, but you know they're talking about things that are 
pretty uh, obscure for the average person. You know, these are these are epidemiologists and pathologists and um, people that are from the centers of excellence all over the United Amanda, States. I apologize for uh, for interrupting. I, I, I apologize for actually asking this uh, question to you during the interview. I, I should have. I, I don't know why this never even occurred to me during the the the, the many conversations that we've had uh, previous to this call. Um, it, it just never occurred to me to to ask this. It just sort of seems odd to me that the Department of Defense would actually be involved with these types of projects. Um, do you have any explanations why the Department of Defense? Will be involved in the, the, the breast cancer, these cancer uh, research uh, organizations. Like, what's what's their interest in, in? If you can speak of that, if you if you don't, if you can't speak of it or you don't know, just simply say you don't know, and we'll move on from there. I apologize for asking on the on the during the live interview, but this oh. just never occurred to me before. It, it just I seems almost, like a, a bit of an unusual unusual organization in a sense to be paying attention to this. Yeah, and it's actually through the Department of the Army to be specific. You know, beyond that, um, but they have a the department, I mean, this is why, again, I encourage people to, to learn about some of the roles of the government, what's going on, who does what, because I didn't know this either. And it's a lot of money. And when I found out, when I found out that people that had breast cancer, like me, were going to Washington, D.C., and they were voting on treatment plans based on, you know, these, these, these grant applications that were 25, you know, pages long, and... And then we're looking at people's grades from high school. I mean, it's very in depth. And so, um, basically, I mean, one of the people I work with is probably going to get a Nobel Prize for one of his discoveries related to breast cancer and the and medication that um, you know. So it's it's really really a great honor. But um, I think that I think that it's really cool that that they ask the consumers to be there because they do value our opinion. I've never I've never felt like they didn't. And um, we have, you know, we'll go over a grant, and they will change the score based on, you know, if you have some input. Um, and, you know, it's a very collaborative process and um, teamwork. And so, they value very much the consumer's opinion. I, as far as um, I think the Department of Army and Department of Defense goes, you'd be surprised how many things they have. You know, it's like Costco. You go to Costco, you see Costco, but you go to Costco's website. Costco, I'm like dropping so many brands today on this phone call. I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you go to Costco's website. Um, it's okay. This is not one of those uh, media things that, uh, you know, we don't mention uh, uh, yeah. products uh, without compensation or something like that. You know, this is uh, yeah. this is, uh, this is an activist web, uh, project. You know, it's it's for sharing of information. I do, uh, do somewhat uh, discourage bashing products because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. but aside from that, I don't, I don't mind mentioning uh, okay. brands or something like that. Yeah, but, so I mean, I have a press release, um, you know, available about about the specifics of that. But um, you know, I think that they actually, the government and the military controls a lot of different things that a lot of people don't know about. And so when I found out about this program, uh, I was, of course, I was elated to be nominated because I didn't even know that we had the ability, or that we were invited to participate in something so important as that. You know, I didn't even know, and, and people don't know. So so that's why, you know, like I said, I encourage people to go look it up because. CDMRP, it's the Congressionally Medi Congressional Medical Research Program. And um, You're yeah. missing the D. The D, wait. Congressionally directed. So Congress directs the appropriate, you know, they appropriate the funds. So um, okay. once they allocate the funding, then the, you know, basically there is a, there is a story here. There was a the company that basically the advocates back in the 70s, they were trying to get the money from Congress to do medical research on breast cancer. They had basically um, gone to a company in, uh, in D.C. And, and you know to execute this whole system. And so they were hired, I guess, and I'm probably chopping this up, but they were hired to um, you know system here. And this is how it kind of got set up. So it was it's executed by the Department of Defense. So everything's like recorded and everything's done really systematically and. Um, so it's we've got like witnesses and everything's recorded and you know it's just really really specific but um, and and very um, like methodical you know the way they do things but uh, I don't know as far as beyond that you know I, I'd have to peek at my um, peek at my press release and and, and even to some of the literature I have and you know it's available uh, for anybody so I recommend everybody to look at that. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Absolutely, it does. So, so of course, uh, well, just uh, we don't have very much more time, so I don't want to get too uh, too in depth with the uh, the CDMRP. But uh, overall, 
uh, from your experience, from from of course uh, this this is a nominated position that you were you were involved in. They they brought you in. Um, what overall message would you share that you you've you've learned from from this organization and made you really aware of um, of how like was there much cannabis related uh, information or is that just sim simply uh, cancer exclusively? Uh, the CDMRP. Yes. Uh, that one is specific to breast cancer specifically. Um, so, like, say if we're reviewing grants and someone is kind of chopping, cutting and pasting their application, let's say you can tell they just applied for, say, a different type of cancer, you know, they're just filling, you know, some people are, there's such a pressure on scientists to get, this is another issue I have, to get um, published. You know, the hierarchy, our, our circle of life has turned into a triangle somewhere, and, and with medical research, it's like, you know, you get jobs based on how many publications you have. You have to be in a, in a you know, like Nature or some kind of peer-reviewed journal. And those are things that get you uh, up in your in your ladder of success. And really, if the goal, and I've asked this before at CDMRP sessions, you know, on the microphone, I've asked, if the goal is to have a solution, then why would we... Uh, why would we do it this way? I don't understand. You know, it's like I would think it would be maybe like a Wikipedia style open source so that if someone is, you know, doing um, you know, research on a specific kinase or protein pathway or something of a of a of a cell, then they can go maybe look that up and, and cross reference with other people and then all of it together we are stronger will make sense. You know, and all of a sudden we're starting to have some some outcomes and some solutions. But sadly, it is more important for people to be published and, and, and work around these um, these uh, social norms than it is to really be part of the solution. You know, they're just mm -hmm. choosing to be part of the problem somehow. Uh, and that, that that's unfair. And um, again, I, just being able to say that and it's, it sort of feel like I, you know, I'm exposing that, uh, that truth, you know, um, I think people should just, again, try to be aware of what's going on around them and and know the roles in the in the in the community and where things come from and get involved and just just you know and ask questions and if not if you don't want to then you know don't shoot it down you know don't be part of the problem by uh, you know passing out bad information I, I, I it makes my job very hard <laughs> you know I say advocacy is the key to counter misinformation well that just means advocacy just means talking then in that in that case well, so, unfortunately you know, there's a lot of people whose jobs depend on them uh misunderstanding information and of course uh, continuing with this uh this propaganda but that's uh yeah another yeah, subject that's entirely totally. related like but, radiation uh, i would love to see radiation go away but anyway i learned so much actually you know having talked to you about this and making me look at my last um four years of my life and everything that it has been i've i've realized that you know that program, the the CDMRP program, has really had a lot to do with with my uh, advocacy efforts and fueling my fire in some of these concerns. Because you know, I was able to see how things go, and I was able to kind of formulate my own questions, and then you know, apply that to other scenarios like the cannabis and research and how this is done. So now, um, you know, at any given time, uh, you know, I keep I keep my eyes on the uh, open trials and things, clinical trials, uh, in in the whole world, it's actually through one website, but you know you can look up THC or you can look up cannabis or you can look up marijuana, and it'll tell you um, there's several hundred tests going on, clinical trials going on, uh, you know, funded by our government, you know, around the clock, and and they have been for a long time. So um, I think that even people who think you know reefer madness or whatever, just consider that like really, well, why would our government be doing? They're not they're not studying peyote, or they're not studying you know. MDMA or whatever like this, they're not doing that kind of studies. I mean, they're not issuing patents on those things, you know, for health, for antioxidant and neuroprotectant. I mean, come on. It's just really... Well, let's it's remember, just, it's a Schedule One drug, so there's no known medicinal value to this anyhow, so... <laughs> which, is, again, I just don't under... I mean, really, I just... Someone has to be like, hey, like, somebody like Madonna or somebody really popular <laughs> and just say, this is not okay. And I don't know why that hasn't happened yet. And so hopefully, hopefully I can get some uh, people stirred up a little bit to you know, not feel uh, scared and um, to ask questions. And, you know, that's kind of what, what the Massive, the One Love Massive, which is what I'm starting barely this year, is just, it's going to be a concert venue that mm -hmm. allows for, you know, food education and uh, advocacy information and at a local level. And um, because we are all one and we all are on 
virtually the same team. Um, you know, getting back to food and things like that, I think that, um, you know, if that was a source of some of our ailments, then that's all the more reason to find a solution to the problem. And um, it, unfortunately, with Manifest Destiny and all of the Americanisms, we've, we've, we've got some pretty deep roots in the financial um, investment for all those things that I'm calling corrupt. But, but it's possible, I think, to, to slowly come back and undo some of the stuff. And I just think we need to be more involved in our, um, in our government, our politics, and our... A day, even a day, you know, sometimes the hardest thing in life is just showing up. And mm-hmm. Just show up, you know. <laughs> just show up. Well, you know what, Amanda, you, you do a lot of uh, interesting things as well. Of course, uh, showing up uh, together, we are stronger is one of your uh, the quotes that you keep on saying. And if you, you said a few moments ago, and I, I love that uh, that quote because, of course, it uh, has encompasses so uh, so many possibilities but you you also are doing a lot of uh, cannabis activism now and of course uh, you're you're trying to raise the uh, the awareness and you're you're doing a lot to to stimulate people to, to towards helping making these uh, these positive changes that we need. Can you share a little bit about what it is that you're doing, how you're doing it? I know that you're you're very active uh, on social media as well. Uh, just share a little bit about what, what it is that you're doing and, and perhaps even get, inspire people of what they, they could do uh, within, you know, whatever capabilities that they may have to towards making a contribution as well. Yeah. Um, well, like I said, I'm just developing right now this, um, nonprofit called One Love Massive, and it's basically, you know, to be uh, educating people on on food knowledge and also cannabis education. Because I think that you know, I I get people like I said, email me all the time about being afraid to, to even ask, you know, and there's so many taboos around it. So I see the disconnect again, and it comes up for me this theme all the time: the disconnect between two entities. And here again, it is with um, people who want to know and they're afraid of their government, they're afraid to ask questions. So I'm going to actually, I accepted an offer to speak um, April 20th here uh, in San Diego. They're going to have a medical cannabis cup and I'm going to, I was contacted by the gentleman who um, produced it and, and and I don't know how he found me, but but yeah, so he, he asked me to speak. And I've only been in San Diego for a year. I was up in Northern California before, so I thought it was pretty cool that, that he heard me. Somebody heard me. <laughs> Um, so for now, I'm, I'm working on a website, and um, you know, right now people email me. And, and what's and your website? Can you just share the address? Uh, it's well, I, you know what? It's not. I don't want to share it yet because it's not live. But I will um, have make that okay, available now, soon. But if they when is it going to be live by? Um, probably next week. Maybe two well, you weeks, know, but you know what? for now. So in, in, in that case, why don't you share it? Because remember, this this recording is not going out until uh, a bit after the twentieth, anyhow. So. Well, actually, I don't know the Earl. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I don't know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Email it to me when you're ready, and what I'll do is I'll post the uh, the URL next to uh, to this recording so that people uh-huh. can click on it. So so just make sure that I okay. have it, and I'll, yeah. I'll definitely uh, publish it so that people can click on it. Because one of the things, of course, I want people to do is I want people to connect with you. Of course, I mentioned uh, your Twitter address and, of course, uh, Facebook. Uh, at the, uh, the start of this call, at the end of the call, I was uh, going to uh, ask you uh, if you had the URL as well that uh, people can uh, well, find I out more about you. you're doing. Uh, pardon me? I, I, think, I can give you a, a few places to find me. Um, it's actually right now, the One Love Massive is going to be under a, under a, a media company creating that website now. But uh, for now, they can go to www.facebook.com backslash O for one, L for love, M for massive, so OLM 2013. And that's the website that I've just started with the um, talking about, you know, the, the, what the massive movement is. It's a revival, and, you know, we're going to have some farmer's markets, live music. We're going to have this up here at Torrey Pines. Um, it's going to be a good summer. It's going to be fun. Um, we're going to start small. It's called a massive because that just really represents the, the impact. It's not so much going to be like a, a Coachella or anything, you know, and, and the focus. It's really going to be, you know, a movement to educate people and get back to the basics and, uh, remembering when carrots were cool, and you know we'll have a we'll have a live art section, and you know it's going to evolve, and it's going to be what it is, but the, the principles will stay the same. So there's that one, and then um, I also started the uh, Pilots for Patients program, which was um, you know taking young adult cancer survivors uh, paragliding with tandem paragliders, which has been a great fun, and that that's also just the Facebook page for now. <laughs> yeah, I've seen the pictures of that. It looks like you had a great time with doing that as well. 
Oh, you know, honestly, anyone who's been told they have cancer is not afraid to jump off a cliff and go flying. I have not had anybody <laughs> think twice about it. And so, you know, again, it's like you shouldn't have to be told that you're dying to start living, you know. Mm. We shouldn't be, like, told, like, I mean, it's really frustrating, you know, to think that my cancer may just come from, from, my, from my environment or my culture. I mean, I want to do things now. I want to live the, the rest of my life the best of my life, you know. And well, well, okay, that's told. a direct quote from uh, Louise Hale, obviously. Uh, cause, uh, I love she, her. Yeah, she's she's fantastic. Uh, well, l- let me just ask you this. Now, of course, you know, of course, uh, everything in our lives, one perspective that we can look at it from a spiritual perspective is that everything is a gift. Everything has a has a purpose as well, and th- things don't just happen randomly. There's there's a there's a reason and a divine purpose for everything that happens. True. Now, of course, when we're going through our challenges, you know, <laughs> I'll say that I'm not fond of going through my challenges, and I'm sure nobody else is. I'm sure when you're going through your cancer, uh, that was no fun. Uh, but now that you're you're in remission, cancer's behind you. You've you've had cancer, and of course, what you've just said that uh, that you no longer have those fears. In a sense, looking at where your life is now, would you say that there's some blessings to this, and uh, that this has made a made you a stronger person? Um, because of course, look at you're, you're doing a lot of activism. You're doing a lot of great things in this world that, that honestly you would not have been doing had this not had occurred to you. That's true. You know, I, I think like people say, Oh, why me? And I you know, I'm part of the group that'll say, Why not me? Um, mm-hmm. I mentioned earlier Elizabeth Cooper Ross and you know, being raised on some of her values and one of those is that I do not believe in coincidence and I believe that everything happens for a reason. We may not know that reason at the time, we may not ever know that reason, but having the faith that everything is in some sort of divine order is where I find uh some serenity, um, because there's no way that there isn't something out there bigger than me. <laughs> I just have a hard time believing that, um, you know, uh, that could be uh, having, you know, been responsible for creating all this. And I and I don't even have to get into any religious stuff with, with that. I can just say that um, I don't believe in coincidence. So I have embraced um, this process, and I'm very lucky to have, like I said, my mom's an oncology nurse, and, um, you know, that, that's been a double-edged sword. But, you know... It's just something that you can never be prepared for. You never want to be, you know, a member of the club. But, but fortunately, um, I've been able to handle it pretty well, I think. And, and not everybody wants anything to do with it afterward. You know, not everybody wants mm-hmm. to be an advocate. Uh, but for me, this is the way it worked. And it's sort of it's still evolving. That's why I've got so much going on with the flying and the One Love Massive and, you know, and then the cannabis stuff. But I, I, I've got so many, so many um, cooks in the... Uh, kitchen that or whatever it is <laughs> that um I actually like I said I moved into my parents home in La Jolla in San Diego and have all my stuff in storage and I'm just mm-hmm. focusing right now on these things because now that I have more of a bit of a direction you know I really I'm going to focus on the massive and um which of course that again encompasses the uh, medical marijuana you know education and um also the food education and and so and whatever else, you know, the advocates in my life that work on different great things, um, you know, they need they need they need love too. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there doing a lot of great stuff, and I'm just one of them. I'm just I'm just I'm the, I mean you know I mean I'm just one of so many. So I'm very blessed to to have this path. I'm I'm glad to be here, um, and I hope that you know I get to see some of my dreams someday come true. <laughs> as far as you know, the things we talked about. Well, you know what? You're definitely in the right place at the right time, so to speak. You know, like, and of course, I think you will understand and appreciate what I'm saying based on the fact that you know who Louise Hayes and a few of the words that you've uh, you've used. I mean, the fact that your parents, you know, were involved with. Well, your mom's an oncology nurse, and of course, uh, your father was uh, uh, involved with the uh, the, uh, the ministry. Oh, Pardon me. The hospice stuff. The yeah. hospice, yeah, and so of course, so that's been part of your life, and and everything that's been going on. You know, many times when we look at our lives, it uh, we don't necessarily. I look at it as a uh, as a, a drawing. You know those little kids drawings that you have. You have a a piece of paper with all these dots with the numbers on it. So you have like one, yeah. two, three, four. So we start with number one. So we we take our pencil and we draw a line from dot one to dot two, and then from dot two to dot three. And then when we start this journey, we have no clue what the heck this picture is going to be, right? Now, we don't have to finish the drawing before we start realizing, oh my God, look at this. You know, like you're halfway done. 
this is a bunny rabbit, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you begin to see the picture as it's, as it's unfolding, and then you begin to anticipate where the next uh, steps are going. So, of course, through your life, you've been exposed to cancer. You've been had all these incidences in your life that have literally been paving the way and preparing you along your journey from dot to dot to dot, moving you towards becoming the person you were always meant to be so that you can see the picture that your life was meant to always be. And and I think that that's, that's an important thing for all of us. I'm saying that for you. I know that's definitely true for me. Like I, I know that I'm meant to do the summit because, heck, I've been, it's, it's really funny actually. Uh, just I'm not going to talk about it right now because it's not about me. This is about you. But I'm sure a lot of other people listening to this, if you really look at your own life, if you're a young kid, a teenager, you may not yet see what your connected dots, uh, you know, mm-hmm. picture is, is making. But if you're a bit older you're beginning to see the picture of your life, and there's, there's a purpose to it. And so, you know what, Amanda, I see that everything that your life has provided you has put you in the right place at the right time to create you to be the person that you're always meant to be so that you become this activist. And you know what? Congratulations for, for doing it. And you know what? You've, you've become stronger, and you've actually uh, also been expressing more life. Like, uh, like you said, you've now got yeah. the courage to do things that you would never have done before. But also that means that you're more ready to live rather than just being scared of living. So and that's the gift. You asked me if there was any gift or whatever. That would be the gift right there is just having that extra paradigm shift that people usually don't have. I mean, I think my colleague just said to me, um, you know, Amanda, the thing that sucks about being young and having cancer is, um, is that you basically are forced to address issues and make decisions and think about things that you shouldn't have to for many decades from now. Mm-hmm. And when he said that, I remember thinking, huh, yeah, okay, so that's the feeling I have. That's what this sucky thing is or, you know, whatever. And, I, you know, it, it, it's hard. I mean, I, for people listening, they're going to think I have some great life of waving a wand at advocating for something, but no, it's really hard work. And, um, you know, I finally, my, my parents are, like, ready to have an intervention on me, and they're like, you know, you need to uh, get a career lady. Um, because, you know, when I was, before I got sick, when I was going to school, I remember thinking, like, what do I want to do for a living where I'm going to wake up every day and want to go to work and do that thing, you know? And I, I ended up being, the solution to that was to be a teacher, and I was going to school to be a special ed teacher specifically for, like, mild to moderate learning disabilities and stuff. And um, that was the thing I decided on after all the facade and everything. And then I ended up getting the, the curveball with, um, with with everything. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't change it for a minute. Um, it is what it is. It's definitely a colorful life. Um, I hope I can provide someone with help or, or information or, you know, along the way. That's just really all my goal is. Um, but because of the passion that I have on these subjects, you know, like I was saying before, I definitely am going to, um, I'm actually going to start, because I haven't had to really get a job. I mean, I, you know, after treatment, you know, you're, a lot of people go on disability and stuff. I didn't do that. I just, I actually worked for a year uh, at a medical office in San Francisco. And um, so I, you know, I, I, I just, I'm at the point now where I really, I don't, I'm not working because I'm doing all of this life work every day, all day. And, and then, you know, I'm working on building the, um, the nonprofit. So, you know, hopefully, um, hopefully I'll figure it out. I mean, I don't know what the animal or the image is going to be on the connected dots, but but it is starting to come clear. And like you said, uh, it's like we are the sum of all of our choices or something. You know, that's like I definitely am a byproduct right now of everything that has been happening. And um, but I definitely hope that I can help others. That's my goal. Well, you know what? We've talked for many hours, uh, like. Well, not many, many, many hours, but quite, quite a few, several hours, anyways, uh, before doing this uh, this interview. And of course, I've been extremely impressed with a your your personality, the level of knowledge that you have. I mean, you're a very intelligent person. It, it's very well, obvious to me you. that you are. You're very welcome. And of course, uh, I just want to say we, we talked a bit, a bit about this before, but uh, I think that people listening to this call, uh, maybe there's someone out there who's listening to this call who could actually use this wonderful personality who's uh, great with people, very, very passionate, outgoing, an activist, uh, you know, uh, definitely. Uh, oh, is it a plus? 
You know, you know what? Yeah, here's a plug. If there's anybody looking to hire someone who's a, who's a great cannabis activist or uh, you know someone who's knowledgeable about cancer, um, you know Amanda's definitely your person to uh, to connect with. So if you're looking for uh, for someone who's got this uh, this personality and intelligence all rolled into one, um, give her a call or or Twitter or Facebook her and. And uh, and see where this uh, this may potentially go. So of course she's 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 open for opportunities, and perhaps you might be one of her dots on her uh, grander scheme of things. And uh, the two of you might have a, a mutually beneficial, um, you know, business relationship, uh, work relationship, whatever it may be. And uh, hopefully that'll. Uh, That'll Thank be a, you. A, a wonderful thing for for everybody. You're welcome. You know, I, I'm definitely a CEO by like nature. Like I'm definitely better off being a boss. I work well with others, but it's funny that you say that because um because with this it just doesn't all of that stuff aside. You know, I just with my passions, I I have my subjects I want to work with, and um and I'm tired. You know, honestly, going through cancer treatment is really tiring, and and um for as much energy and effervescence as you say I have, you know that what goes up must come down. I have my days where you know I have to rest and stuff, but um. But it's definitely it's my passion, and it would be wise for me to to continue this uh, because I'm going to do very big things. I I'm going to continue to do big things because this is um this is my life, and I'm and I'm I'm just really excited. I'm so glad that you found me, and I'm really glad to be here um, with with the summit and all the wonderful people that are involved. And I really look forward to actually working more with you and a lot of the adventures that are going to unfold ahead with all of this. Uh, wonderful history in the making. Well, thank you so very much. I, I know you've been uh, very flattering of uh, of your opinion of the summit and all, and uh, I, I'm very grateful for uh, for you for that. And for what it's worth, I I think this is just the start. Uh, I know that we'll be talking more after the summit's over, and of course in preparation for next year's summit. I I have a feeling that uh, we'll we'll be talking and doing something again for next year's summit. I'm not sure exactly where this uh, connect the dots will go, but uh, but I mm-hmm. definitely see our pictures intertwined in that sense. <laughs> for yeah, for what definitely. it's worth, and uh, yeah, I, I've been very very, very impressed with uh, a lot of the things that you said and a lot of the things that you're doing. And so, again, I think that people really need to uh, to, to pay attention to you. So, I mean, follow Amanda on uh, on Twitter. Uh, you know, like her on uh, on Facebook, and uh, and uh, you know, befriend her there as well, so you can uh, follow along what she's doing. Uh, eventually, she'll have a website. Uh, we've we've been talking about that for the past couple of months. Uh, so, I'm glad to know that that that's, uh, that project's coming along, so that uh, people can also um, sort of be aware of what you're working on and the. the activist projects that, uh, and the information that you're disseminating because, of course, as you've mentioned also earlier during, during this call, uh, or was it uh, some other time? I'm not sure. Some of this information is blending in my mind. Was it during this interview or was it before? <laughs> but uh, anyhow, of course, I know that you disseminate a lot of information and people contact you. Uh, you know, people are saying, hey, I've got cancer. Where, where, where can I go for this information? How can I get this uh, Rick Simpson oil or, or other questions that they have? And you know what? If one person's emailing you, there's literally a thousand people out there wondering the exact same thing. So I know that you're yeah. creating some, uh, some great information on, uh, on your site as well. So, so people should definitely uh, should definitely check out and see the resources that you're creating. I think it's definitely worth for them to uh, to at least follow along with what you're doing. And uh, I wish you success in everything that you're doing. And I'm sure I have absolute faith that you know we'll get to that year five of five very soon mm-hmm. in a couple more years. And uh, you know what, uh, Amanda, I know that it was a hard past few years for you. I I I. I can only imagine. I, I cannot say that I, I, I really empathize or, or know what you've gone through, but I can, I can somewhat surmise that uh, it, it's been challenging. But you know what the saying is, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I think of all the people that I've ever heard that that saying would be applicable, you definitely embody that. You know? Oh, you thank you. Stronger, so you're very welcome. Well, okay, so back to the website. Not my website, but there is one website that I kind of think I was not sure if I was going to plug it or not, but you know, regarding uh, some of the information that I have, uh, underground information, you know, some of the stuff, you know, I talk about, I got on clinical trials websites, government websites and things, but there's also the the other side of that, which is just the real end of day stuff that goes on around the house, around town, whatever, social networking. So there is a, a gentleman who is um, doing some work in the East Coast with, he's a farmer, oh, yes. young guy, yeah, and I just... Um, I, I don't want to throw it out. I was I was wrapping up already. I know, I know it's okay. No, I just, you know, it's okay. No, let's definitely talk about him. I'm sorry, I completely forgot about uh, discussing him. Yes, please. Yeah, um, I don't want to talk too much about it. I just want to I just want to maybe give the website address because you know basically what we're dealing with here is that 
there's so much information about cannabis that we have to get to people. But basically, you know, when I talk about studies being done in government level and stuff on the health benefits, we're talking about cellular level. We're talking about CBDs, which, you know, there's the THC, which makes you psychoactive, kind of high feeling. And then there's the CBD, which is another component of the plant. And the CBD has a ton, a ton, a ton of uh, benefits uh, to our health. Um, you know, like the patent I talked about, that one is on the, them being uh, antioxidant and neuroprotectant. So mm-hmm. basically, this guy, has, has, whether it was by accident or what, I don't know how he did it, but he's got some, I think, 12 strains of, uh, of marijuana plants that he's legally uh, running, you know, up there. And basically, um, I think he has a history in farming and maybe um, he's doing some dog breeding or something. So he's got a knowledge of the the way things work um, scientifically. But, uh, you know, the CBD percentage on a chemical analysis is really important for, uh, you know, if you're going to be trying to do this for your health. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a magic thing, practically, that this plant can produce this. And it has so many benefits. It's such a dynamic, dynamic plant. But basically, he has got some uh, labs reports uh, on his chemical analysis of his of his plants that are off the charts. And I have not, personally, I'm in San Diego. It's way over on the East Coast. But, um, uh, can you give me some seen, of the numbers? Like, what kind of numbers are we talking about, the CBD level? Well, this, for his, his CBD in, his, uh, in, the, in the flowers, in the plant, he's, he's, reaching, um, he's reaching like 17 to 20%. Wow. Okay. And this is, he's doing a combination of that with THC and, kind of and the, THC being... Of, being low or high, he, he can manipulate the THC levels too. Okay. Uh, so, so he can do a, a high CBD, low THC for the person who maybe is um, sensitive and doesn't want to have the mental psychoactive effects um, or is, say, the situation called for that, like if you're at work or something. And um, also, you know, there's other components like THCA and, T, you know, that, that help with your... Um, mm-hmm. It helps with your skeletal system, and there's just so much people really need to understand that this is a very dynamic uh, plant with a lot of different benefits. But um, you know, like I said, he can manipulate the THC level, and he figured out a method to get the CBDs really high. And he even has some concentrates. I saw the lab results from where he, you know, like a like a concentrate. Um, maybe you call it. Um, I don't know what you call it, like a full like like a full melt wax or something like that. Yeah, and his um, are like 85 percent in the concentrate form, but but, you know, when we're talking about medical, yes. Wow, that's, yeah. that's, that's so, really high. Or that's really stony, I should say. But <laughs> I well, you understand what I mean? Me, that's, that's like, yeah, honestly, it's medicine. So when you start looking at um, how, you know, the processes of when we say cannabis is medicine, like we're talking about keeping your, your cells healthy and keeping that DNA force factory line functioning in a healthy, effective way, this plant is the answer to that. And those CBDs are what makes that happen. And they provide... Uh, you know, apoptosis and a good good system for for all of the. Uh, I don't want to get too scientific about it, but you know, there's so much we don't know as well. So I just I support I support novel and innovative research. I always will support medical research and funding for that. Um, but I also think that it, more importantly, I support watchdogs and 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 people like me who are going to be there to say, do it and do it transparently, so we can all see what you're doing, you know, because mm-hmm. we are the ones affected by it. If it wasn't my business, I wouldn't try to make it. But, but this is our business, and it tried, you know, it tried to kill me, this, this cancer. And and if, if somebody told me doing cartwheels under a full moon, naked, was going to help with my cancer, I guarantee you, I would do those cartwheels. So that's why I'm pushing this cannabis movement thing, because whether it was cannabis or cartwheels. I'm going to want to know, you know, I want to know, and I'll be the girl to, you know, to look under that rock. So, um, you know, feel free to, to send questions, and I'm, like I said, I'll get you that, that website address. But his website, for this, this guy, I don't want to blow him up or anything, <laughs> but um, hopefully by the time this airs, I'll get to warn him. <laughs> but it's uh, <laughs> www. <laughs> www. Actually, I just texted him as we were talking right now, and I just <laughs> I'm going to send your website. So, um you know, there are laws in his state that will allow him to care for only so many patients. Um, but he So what is, he's doing is legal. So so just so, that, because of course there's a lot of people who are under course. the radar or or being very discreet. However, this guy, obviously if he's got a website about this, uh, he's... And state you know, laws vary. You know, you got to look at your yeah. state laws versus whatever. And um, he actually moved out of the state he was living in to... to, to to dedicate his life to this. Um, he's a sweetheart and a uh, good guy. And um, like I said, he's really got his heart into it. He's, 
yeah, he's. I can't. I don't want to implicate anything here. But um, anyways, he's going to be doing big things, and I, I, I really can see him getting like a Nobel Prize for, <laughs> for this plant discovery. And it just blows my mind because even people in our in our community and our culture who I try to tell this to, and I'm like, hey, look at what I try to link him online and stuff. People are just busy. Uh, it's kind of like the other researchers. They're really concerned about getting their own strain out, or they don't even want to take them to the lab to get tested because they're afraid the lab's going to steal their their. Uh, their strain. So I don't get all that, all that stuff. But basically, if you want to know more about this gentleman and and, and his CBDs that he's working on, and he has edibles too. He's actually got products on the um, website. You can read the chemical analysis labs and stuff. So it's um, www.thepureeastcoast.com, and that's the t h e p u r e eastcoast.com. Okay, sorry, thepureeastcoast.com. Mm-hmm. Okay, the pure as in purity or cure as in cure something? Oh, pure, uh, T as in perfect. P-U-R-E, okay. as in uh, the opposite is uh, tainted. It's not okay. pure. So, so was it, uh, how many words are we? Uh, <laughs> Four, <laughs> not pure East brain. Coast. The pure East Coast, okay. Uh, dot com. Dot com, all right. Yep. That's all I, I think I, I'll leave that little rabbit hole there for now. But, you know, he's one of probably, like, you, you know, we say other people that are doing these great things. And I just think that, um, you know, for, forget anybody who's trying to monopolize on the, on, the, on the money part. I'm not interested in those people. I, I'm interested in how we can become a better community and, and be stronger together and just, you know, help this, help free the leaf. <laughs> Yeah, well, just for what it's worth, because a number of times uh, it's been said, uh, there are different uh, different speakers as well in different ways. I just want to say, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with people. You know, I mean, especially in America, I mean, it is a a, a free economy system. Uh, you know, like a land of the well, not land of the free. Hold on a second. What's the uh, the model that I'm looking for? Well, you know, like basically entrepreneurship is is encouraged. Oh, and I think yeah. that there, there's definitely something to be said about that. So I hear what you're saying, and of course, some other people. There's there's a there's a balance between greed and uh, and of course uh, entrepreneurship we're providing a, a valuable service. So there's there's good people out there, and I think right. that uh, and of course. So what I'm hearing you saying, of course, he's not greedy, but he's protecting uh, protecting uh, essentially an asset so that hopefully he can continue to... I want to protect him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, protect him in, in the sense that, uh, you know what, we there, all need there's, to protect a lot of cost, there's a lot of cost involved in creating these strains and doing all this research, and so want to be able to reward him as well, but also to support him to do further research. I mean, if obviously he creates something outstanding, hopefully he can uh, do something even more outstanding down, uh, down yeah. the road. So, I think so, he. I think he's capable of that. He's definitely going to be a solution to some of our problems. And, and like I said, he's giving away. Uh, these, he's going to be giving away these strains, clones to dispensaries for free. You know, that want them and that qualify for whatever laws in their state. How that ever that would work. But you know, he's okay. definitely not doing this for for money. He's doing it for the good of humanity. And, and when you talk to him, you can hear that. So hopefully, he'll be on uh, next year. You get to interview him because he's yeah, you've. Uh, for what it's worth, of course, I would have uh, I would have definitely interviewed him and just uh, by the time I don't think he was we were ready. talking about it, uh, well, he wasn't ready, but uh, also uh, I, I was getting to the point where I had to sort of like uh, solidify the, uh, the, 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 yes. the, the the guest <laughs> list. <laughs> yeah, the guest list, and uh, uh, yeah, there's, there was enough work, but uh, definitely I would love to, to connect with him and a couple of the other people that you were uh, connecting with as well. One thing I'm very impressed with, of course, is you're, you're an outstanding activist, as we've already mentioned before, but also you are very well connected as well. You, you, you definitely are a very friendly, likable personality, so of course it's no surprise that a lot of these wonderful people are going to you know, be attracted to you. And so you know, for example, you actually hooked me up with Paul uh, Stanford, and mm-hmm. so thank you very much much because uh, I actually really uh, wanted to connect with someone like him and you actually made that happen so uh, I, I'm grateful to you for that and of course now you're connecting me with this uh, this other gentleman and there's a couple other people that you've been mentioning as well so uh, so <laughs> look out, look the, the 2014 uh, summit will definitely be stacked oh. by a lot of referrals oh, yeah. from Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> well it's, if I have a gift of cancer I think that's probably the gift that keeps on giving is that um, you know it doesn't discriminate and so I've been able to, you know, cross all sorts of different uh, groups and cultures and things just in the process of reaching out. I've got friends all over the world. Um, my, my, even the pilot program became International Alliance of Pilots for Patients because 
all of a sudden there was such a, a international need and interest in these people taking young adult cancer patients and them flying. So, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll confess to cancer. I'll put the credit on there because I've really been able to, um, to you know, it, it doesn't discriminate. So I've just been able to meet some great people and um, I guess I, I'll take a compliment too about my personality. Effervescent, you were the second person who called me that. There was an interview I did for Stand Up Paddle magazine and uh, the girl called me that in the interview and I, I giggled and I, I was thinking, isn't that like... Um, some sort of indigestion list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think there was an advertisement for it. It's like you plop this big, huge pill into a glass of water and it just starts fizzing up. But, uh, I'm just but trying to visualize me. You're, you're like ginger ale, or actually forget ginger ale, you're like the champagne. you got that sparkling effervescence in you. Oh, there you go. Personality. So, so, of course. Well, I hope that people can pick up on it and we can work together and, you know, in uh, solving some of, our, some of our issues and have fun and, you know, like I said, it's just about the truth, and um, I, I'm a pretty simple girl, pretty simple girl. Well, you know what, thank you for uh, for being who you are and uh, sharing with us your, your connect-the-dot uh, life. <laughs> <laughs> it's a crazy and, uh, road. It's a crazy road. No, but uh, I, of course, we talked so much. Uh, 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 it, it, also, previous to uh, to this interview uh, about cancer and breast cancer, so I know that there's a lot of uh, people who have cancer, and uh, particularly breast cancer, who of course uh, should definitely follow you and uh, on your uh, you know Facebook and stuff like that, and connect with you. Even, uh, I mean, you've beaten cancer. You've also uh, beaten breast cancer, and of course, there's a lot of insights that I'm sure that you you can and do provide for people for. Uh, that that can actually be of benefit and help them. So you know what, you're yeah. helping a lot of people in so many different ways. So you know what, thank you. Thank you. I, I thank you on behalf of everybody that you've helped, oh. on behalf of the summit, and all the people that will be touched by your life or you know by your story and your words in the future as well. So so thank you, Amanda. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share that and everything. And you know, it just reminds me. I actually forgot to mention there's a study that was published uh, from our government, which you know corresponding correlating correlating uh, cannabis as a um, specifically as a treatment for breast cancer. And it talked about this hormone receptor factor. And I'll tell you that you're either one or the other. So the fact that they use the word hormone receptor just means that it applies to both types of breast cancer, which means totally universal. So, you know, there's some things here that are in the works that, you know, I really need to, to get out there. and Because that's, you know, that's a huge population of women and even some men get breast cancer. But um, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. That's why I'm trying to take this year to really focus on the cannabis side of things rather than um, so much the uh, the cancer stuff because mm-hmm. ultimately I want the roots to meet and they're going to merge. And, and, uh, but like to, to say that there is a uh, government study that, you know, correlates, uh, you know, I think they called it treatment. They even said it could be used as a treatment. I'll have to find it and I'll post it. But these are good things. This means they're talking about it. The conversation is changing. You know, we just got to keep up the momentum and keep mm-hmm. doing what you're doing. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> we invite more people to join us. <laughs> Yay, well. I know. There's so many. It, yeah, it's just going to be a, a huge... I just can't believe, actually, once you hit, once you contacted me, I couldn't believe that this wasn't already, you know, established by somebody. I just think it's fantastic. And I'm so excited to see what you're going to be producing out of this next... From well, here I'll, forward. I'll just... I'll just share for what it's worth. Uh, I, um, I I had this thought for a long time that someone should do this, and I kept on looking, thinking someone should do this. Nobody's doing this. Someone should do this. Months go by. I keep on thinking mm-hmm. someone should do this. And of course, I like what you said earlier in this call. Um, why not me? Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I I really did not want it to be me. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I did not want it to be me. But eventually, I got fed up <laughs> enough with everything and I got so impassioned by what I see mm-hmm. you know th- th- we need this for the world we we need this mm-hmm. for 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 so many people this this is so important this transcends any individual or any uh, particular uh, issue or company or anything like that we need this and you know what I didn't see anybody doing this so I finally said well I guess I'm the one to do it so so be thank it thank you but, and thank yeah. your family for letting you do this 
Yes, my wife actually gave me permission. Actually, it's really funny the story about that. My my, my wife actually uh, suggested it uh, that it be done. Uh, well, I mentioned it, and she said you should do this, and I was shocked by her response. I actually was expecting the complete opposite, but I won't get into that road right now. But uh, Amanda, of course, thank you so very much for what you're doing, and of course, for all of you who are listening in this call and are sitting on the fence, uh, feeling some sort of stirring of motivation within your soul to do something. This is your wake up call. This is your time to do it. Please, please follow your heart. Please follow your passion. Please follow those stirrings and do what you were meant to do all along to complete your next line of your connect the dots. Mm-hmm. I like it. I like it a lot. Thank you well, so much again, for your Amanda, time. Well, thank you so very much for your time as well. And uh, it's been absolutely I'm, delightful. And I know that we'll be talking again. Yes, we will. And now I'm going to go get my my body scan and the check out my skeletal system <laughs> back to the reality yeah I'll, I'll, but i always i always uh, educate the, the text when i do these appointments about cannabis it's, every day it's a little bit more a little bit closer <laughs> so thanks again You're and welcome. Thank you. i look forward to seeing all of the wonderful people that you've brought together okay thank you <laughs>